Yesterday I spoke of the awakening experienced at the first Pentecost by the individuals who are generally known as the Apostles of Christ Jesus. This is not to say, of course, that the whole content of the fifth gospel, as I am telling it, immediately came to the Apostles' minds. Clairvoyant consciousness does show us those images in their souls at the time. But the whole lived in them not so much in images, but if I may put it like this, as direct living experience, a feeling and power of the soul. And the words the apostles were then able to say, captivating even the Greeks at the time, words that provided the impulse for Christian evolution, the power they bore in their souls, in heart and mind, all this blossomed forth from the living power of the fifth gospel in their souls. They were able to speak the way they did, act the way they did, because the content of what we now decipher as the fifth gospel was alive in them, even if they did not put it in words the way I have to do today. They had gone through a process of resurrection, as it were, in which they were quickened by the all-prevailing cosmic love. And after this, their work was under the influence of that love. The power which the Christ had become after the mystery of Golgotha was active in them. With this, we have reached a point where we have to speak about Christ's life on earth in terms of the fifth gospel. It is not easy to put this into words that are in accord with modern thinking. We may, however, be able to use some of the concepts and ideas gained in the science of the Spirit to come closer to this, the greatest secret on earth. To understand the Christ Spirit, we have to apply some of the concepts gained through that science in a slightly different form. To get some degree of clarity, let us begin with the event generally called the baptism by John in the Jordan. In the fifth gospel, this relates to the life of the Christ as conception does to the life of a human being on earth. The life of Christ from then until the mystery of Golgotha may be compared to the life of the embryo in its mother's womb. The Christ spirit may be said to have gone through embryonic life between the baptism by John and the mystery of Golgotha. The mystery of Golgotha itself, that is, the death of Jesus, has to be seen as the birth of the Christ Spirit on earth, whose real life on earth began after the mystery of Golgotha. Then Christ went about with the apostles, who were in an altered state of consciousness at the time. Ascension and the pouring out of the Spirit which followed must be seen as something which in our case would normally be regarded as entering into the world of the Spirit as we die. The continued life of the Christ in the earth's sphere after Ascension or Pentecost has to be compared to what the human soul experiences in Devakan, parenthesis in quotes, God country, close quote, close parenthesis, or the Spirit land. We see, therefore, that when it comes to the Christ Spirit, we have to change all our concepts concerning the sequence of stages in human life. After a short interval, generally known as the time of purification, human souls enter the world of the Spirit, where they prepare for their next life on earth. We thus live in the Spirit after death. The Christ Spirit went through something which was to it exactly what the transition to spirit land is to us, entering into the earth sphere. Instead of entering a realm of the spirit, as human beings do after death, the Christ Spirit brought a sacrifice by making its heaven on earth, as it were. Human beings leave the earth in exchange for a dwelling place in heaven, as the saying goes, the Christ left heaven to seek his dwelling place on earth. Please consider this in the right light and connect with it a feeling 
for what happened through the mystery of Golgotha, through the Christ Spirit. The true sacrifice made by the Christ Spirit was to leave the spheres of the Spirit to live on earth and among human beings, and thus give the impulse that would guide humanity and evolution on earth toward the future. This does not mean that the Christ Spirit did not belong to the earth's sphere before the baptism by John in the Jordan. It came from spheres beyond the earth. The experiences between the baptism and Pentecost had to be gone through so that the heavenly Christ Spirit might be transformed into the Christ Spirit on earth. It is saying infinitely much when this secret is uttered in the words. Since the first Pentecost, the Christ Spirit has been with human souls on earth. Before that, it was not with them on earth. Everything the Christ Spirit went through between the baptism by John and the Pentecost event happened so that the God could exchange his dwelling place in heaven for one in the earth's sphere. The events in Palestine were gone through in order that this divine spiritual Christ entity might assume the form it needed to enable it to live in communion with human souls. This also shows that the event in Palestine was unique, as I have said on many occasions. A higher spirit, who was not of the earth, came down into the earth's sphere and will remain with it until it has gone through the necessary transformation. The Christ spirit has therefore been active on earth from that time. To understand the Pentecost event fully in the light of the fifth gospel, we must fall back on the concepts developed in the science of the spirit. We know that in earlier times the human soul was raised through initiation in mystery centers to levels where it could participate in the life of the spirit. This can be seen most clearly if we consider the Persian or Mithras mysteries. Initiation was in seven stages. The individual would first achieve a rank symbolically called the raven. He would then become an quote, occult person, close quote, a secret one. The third rank was that of fighter, the fourth the lion, and in the fifth he would be given the name of the people he belonged to. The sixth rank was that of sun hero, the seventh that of father. Concerning the first four levels, it is sufficient to say that the individual would be gradually taken deeper and deeper into spiritual experience. At the fifth level, he would gain the ability to have an expanded consciousness, which would enable him to be the protector of his whole nation. He would accordingly bear the name of that nation. An initiate of the fifth degree would participate in the life of the Spirit in a specific way. We know from a lecture course given here that the nations were guided by spirits in the hierarchies we call the archangeloi or archangels. An initiate of the fifth degree would be raised to their sphere and participate in the life of the archangels. Such initiates were needed in the cosmos which is the reason why this form of initiation existed on earth. When such an individual had been initiated into the fifth degree and gone through all the inner experiences to gain the soul content required for that level, the archangel of the individual's nation would look down on his soul, as it were, and read it the way we read a book which provides the information we need to perform a particular action. Initiates of the fifth degree were required on earth so that the archangels might read their souls like a book and know what the nation needed. These initiates mediated between the archangels who were the nation's true leaders and the nation itself. They took to the sphere of the archangels 
what was needed for proper guidance of their nation. How was the fifth degree attained in pre-Christian times? It could not be attained if the human soul remained in the body. The soul had to be lifted out of the body in the process of initiation. Out of the body the soul went through experiences that gave it the content I have described. The soul had to leave the earth and ascend to the world of the spirit in order to achieve what it was meant to achieve. When the sixth degree of that ancient initiation had been reached, more came alive in the sun hero's soul than was needed to guide a nation. If you consider human evolution on earth as a whole, you will see nations come into existence and vanishing again, going through a process of transformation, as it were. Nations are born and die, just like people. A nation's achievements for the earth have to be preserved, however, for the sake of human evolution as a whole. A nation needs not only to be guided, but the work it does on earth has to be taken beyond the confines of the nation. The spirits who had this task, the time spirits, are above the archangels. They were able to read in the souls of initiates of the sixth degree what would make the work of a nation contribute to the work of humanity as a whole, letting it spread over the whole earth. Anyone who was to become a sun hero also had to go out of the body and actually make the sun his dwelling place. All this may sound incredible, if not downright foolish, to modern minds. We may remember St. Paul's words that wisdom in the eyes of the gods is often foolishness in the eyes of people. During this stage of initiation, therefore, the sun hero would be in harmony with the whole solar system, with the sun his dwelling place, just as ordinary human beings have the earth as their home planet. We have hills and rivers around us. The sun heroes had the planets of the solar system around them during their initiation. In the ancient mysteries it was only possible to be transported to the sun when out of the body. Returning to their bodies they would remember what they had experienced and were able to use it as powers of will to benefit human evolution as a whole. The sun heroes would return to their bodies with all the powers gained when out of the body during initiation and they would be able to make the work of their nation part of human evolution as a whole. During the three and a half days of initiation, the sun heroes experienced communion with the Christ, who was not on earth at that time, which was before the mystery of Golgotha. The sun heroes of old would all go up into the sun sphere, the only place where they could have communion with the Christ. This is the world from which the Christ later came down to earth. We may say, therefore, that something that required the whole old initiation procedure and was possible only for a few individuals happened like a natural event for the Christ's apostles at Pentecost. In the past, human souls had to ascend to the Christ. Now the Christ had descended to the Apostles. In a way, the Apostles now had the sole content of the sun heroes of old. The spiritual power of the sun poured out over their souls and from then on continued to be active in human evolution. The event of Palestine, the mystery of Golgotha, had to happen so that an entirely new power might take effect on earth. Where, however, did the roots of the, for the Christ's existence on earth lie? They lay in profound suffering, suffering that went beyond anything human beings can imagine. If we are to get the right idea at this point, it will again be necessary to remove some obstacles that exist in the modern mind. I am afraid it will be necessary to bring in a number of things 
if we are to understand the meaning of the fifth gospel. A book has recently appeared, which I greatly recommend. It is written by a man of some genius, proof of the kind of nonsense even people of genius may produce when it comes to matters of the spirit. I am referring to Maurice Metterling's book on the nature of death. It contains all kinds of nonsense, including the statement that people can no longer suffer once they are dead, because they are spirits then and no longer have a body. And according to Metterlich, a spirit does not suffer, only the body suffers. This intelligent man deludes himself, therefore, that only the physical body can suffer, and consequently a dead person cannot suffer. He fails to realize what tremendous, almost unbelievable nonsense it is to think that only a physical body consisting of physical forces and chemical substances can suffer as if suffering were limited to physical matter and forces. They do not suffer at all. If they were able to suffer, so would a stone. The physical body cannot suffer. It is the mind and the soul that suffer. We have reached a point today where people think the opposite of what really makes sense, even concerning the simplest things. There would be no suffering in Kamaloka, if the life of mind and spirit could not suffer. It is exactly because it then truly misses the physical body that Kama Loka means suffering. Anyone who believes that it is impossible to suffer in mind and spirit will be unable to get a real idea of the infinite suffering the Christ spirit went through during those years in Palestine. Before I speak of this, I have to draw your attention to something else. We have to realize that at the baptism by John in the Jordan, a spirit came down to earth who then lived for three years in an earthly body, going through death in that body. Before the baptism, That spirit lived in conditions that were completely different from those on earth, which means that this spirit had no earthly karma. Please consider this carefully. For three years, a spirit lived in the body of Jesus of Nazareth here on earth, whose soul was free of all earthly karma. This means that all the experiences that Christ had, everything he went through in life, had a totally different significance compared to what a human soul may go through, for instance. When we suffer or go through an experience, we know our sufferings are due to karma. It was different for the Christ spirit. He had to go through life on earth for three years without the burden of karma. What does this mean for him? It meant suffering for no karmic reason suffering that was truly undeserved and without guilt. The fifth gospel is the anthroposophical gospel. It shows that the life of Christ in a human body was the only karma-free life that was lived, with the karma concept not applicable the way it is to humans. Further study of this gospel also shows something else in connection with those three years. This life, we have compared it to embryonic life, also did not create karma. It was blameless. A life was therefore lived on earth that was not determined by karma and did not create karma. We have to take all these concepts and ideas at their deepest level. If we do so, we may gain much that will help us to understand this extraordinary event in Palestine which otherwise proves inexplicable in many respects. We need to consider many things if we are to understand. Think of all the contradictory statements made about this event and how much it has been misunderstood. And yet it brought about impulse after impulse in the course of human evolution. It is just 
that we do not always go deep enough in considering these things. A time will come when people will speak very differently of it, realizing its tremendous depth. A hint has been given by saying that a life free from all karma was lived on earth for three years. We often pass over things that are of deep significance without giving them a thought. Some of you may have heard of Ernest Renan's title, A Life of Jesus, which was published in 1863. We read the book without realizing its full significance. A time will come when people will wonder why so many people have been reading the book until today without any feeling for the truly strange and peculiar aspect of it. The peculiar thing is that the book is a half-and-half mixture of sublime presentation and cheap novel. In times to come, it will be considered most peculiar that there could be such a mixture. Read the book with this in mind. Read what he turns the Christ into, who for him is, of course, essentially Jesus Christ. He makes him into a hero who initially has good intentions and is a great benefactor of humanity, but then is caught up in popular enthusiasm and increasingly gives way to people's wishes and desires, to anything people want to hear and like to be told. Ernest Renan does to the Christ on a large scale what we often find people do to us on a smaller scale. It does happen that when people see a movement like theosophy gain ground, they become critical of its teacher. Initially, they will say, his intentions were quite good. Then came those evil adherents who ruled him with their flattery. He made the mistake of saying what his audiences wanted to hear. Renan has treated the life of Christ in this way. He even had the audacity to present the raising of Lazarus as a kind of fraud which Jesus allowed to happen because it was a useful means of rousing the rabble. He had the audacity to let Jesus get into a temper, a passion, and increasingly give in to people's instincts. As a result, a cheap novel element is mixed in with the sublime passages the book also contains. The strange thing is that anyone with sound common sense, I am not going to say much about this, ought to feel shock and horror when presented with a figure who initially has the best intentions but finally gives in to popular instincts and allows all kinds of fraud to be committed. Renan has no feelings of horror. He refers to this figure in beautiful, rousing terms. This is certainly strange. It shows how much human souls feel drawn to the Christ, irrespective of whether they understand him or not. This may go so far that someone makes the life of Christ into a cheap novel, but nevertheless cannot find enough words of admiration designed to draw people to that figure. Such things are only possible with someone who enters into earth evolution the way the Christ does. Believe me, much karma would have been created during the Christ's three years of life on earth if he had lived the way Renan says he did. In time to come, people will realize that such a work simply does not stand up to the truth. For it will be realized that the life of Christ was not based on old karma and did not create new karma. That is the message of the fifth gospel. The event by the river Jordan, which we call the baptism by John, may be compared with a human being's conception. The fifth gospel tells us that the gospel of Luke correctly says what could have been heard at the time if someone with a highly developed clairvoyant mind had heard the cosmic words used to express the mystery that came to pass. The words that sounded from heaven were indeed, quote, This is my Son, the much beloved. Today I have begotten him. Close quote. Those words in the Gospel of Luke tell the truth of what happened by the river Jordan, the begetting, the conception of the Christ into the earth's spirit. 
For the moment, let us leave aside the nature of the earthly individual on whom the Spirit of Christ descended at the baptism in the Jordan. We will speak of this in later lectures. For the moment, let us take it that a man called Jesus of Nazareth provided a body for the Christ Spirit. The fifth gospel tells us we can read this by looking back with clairvoyant vision that the Christ Spirit was only loosely connected with the body of Jesus of Nazareth at the beginning of its earthly pilgrimage. It was not the kind of connection that normally exists between body and soul, with the latter living wholly in the body. It was such that the Christ Spirit could leave the body of Jesus of Nazareth at any time if this proved necessary. The body of Jesus of Nazareth would be in one place as though asleep, and the Christ Spirit would set out to go to some other place as need arose. The fifth gospel shows that the body of Jesus of Nazareth was not always present when the Christ Spirit appeared to the apostles. The Spirit would, however, appear in such a way that they would take the apparition for the body of Jesus of Nazareth. They did notice a difference, but this was too small to be always clearly apparent. This is not fully evident in the other four Gospels, but the fifth Gospel makes it quite clear. The Apostles were not always able to say if the Christ stood before them in the body of Jesus of Nazareth or as a spiritual entity only. They generally would not give it much thought, and take it to be the Christ Spirit, insofar as they were able to recognize him in the body of Jesus of Nazareth. However, in the course of the three years of life on earth, the Spirit became more and more closely bound up with the body of Jesus of Nazareth, with the etheric nature of the Christ, coming to resemble the physical body of Jesus of Nazareth more and more closely. It is important to realize that again the process was different in the case of the Christ Spirit than in ordinary human beings. To gain understanding of this, it is right to say, the ordinary human being is a microcosm relative to the macrocosm, a small image of the whole macrocosm. The whole great cosmos is reflected and comes to expression in the physical human body as it develops on earth. The opposite was the case with the Christ Spirit. A macrocosmic sun spirit assumed the form of the human microcosm, squeezing itself together and increasingly condensing itself to identify more and more closely with the human microcosm. It was exactly the opposite. When the Christ's life on earth began, immediately after the baptism in the Jordan, the connection with the body of Jesus of Nazareth was very loose indeed, with the Christ's spirit still completely outside the body of Jesus of Nazareth. Walking the earth, the Christ's spirit was still working in a way that was entirely beyond this earth. People were healed in a way no power on earth can achieve. The Christ Spirit spoke to people with divine intensity. It acted as a spirit from beyond this earth, merely tying itself to the body of Jesus of Nazareth, as it were. As time went on, it identified more and more with the body of Jesus of Nazareth, compressing itself, contracting, entering into, and becoming involved in earthly conditions, so that the divine powers were gradually lost. The Christ Spirit went through all this in adapting to the body of Jesus of Nazareth, a development which, in a sense, may be called downhill. The Christ Spirit had to experience the progressive loss of divine power and might as the God gradually became a human being. Like someone who sees his body go into decline in a process involving infinite pain, the Christ Spirit saw its divine content dwindle away 
as its etheric nature identified more and more with the earthly body of Jesus of Nazareth, until it was so close that it could feel the anxiety and fear known to human beings. The other Gospels also speak of this when they refer to Christ Jesus going to the Mount of Olives with his disciples and how the sweat of fear rose on his brow. The Christ became man in the same measure as the etheric Christ spirit became more like the body of Jesus of Nazareth. The divine powers of a God who could perform miracles faded away. We see that the passion of the Christ spirit began soon after the baptism by John in the Jordan when he healed the sick and drove out demons because he had divine powers. The people who saw what the Christ was able to do were amazed and said that no one on earth had ever done such things. At that early stage, the Christ spirit did not resemble the body of Jesus of Nazareth closely. Over a period of three years, the road took the Christ spirit from being a sensation and causing amazement to the point where it had adapted itself closely to the body of Jesus of Nazareth. This body had become so sick and feeble that the Christ spirit was no longer able to answer the questions put by Pilate, Herod, and Caiaphas. It had identified with the progressively weakening body of Jesus of Nazareth to the point where the Christ Spirit, in the frail, decayed body, did not respond to the question, quote, Did you say you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Close quote. He stood in silence before the Jewish high priest, and he stood in silence before Pilate, who had asked him if he had called himself king of the Jews. The way of the passion thus went from the baptism in the Jordan to utter powerlessness. Soon the gaping masses, who earlier had been amazed at the super-earthly miraculous powers of the Christ Spirit, no longer expressed admiration. They stood before the cross, mocking the God, who had become human and powerless with the words, quote, If you are a God, come down from the cross. You have been helping others, now help yourself. Close quote. The way of the God's passion went from the fullness of divine powers to utter powerlessness. A road of infinite suffering for the God who became man. And added to this was the pain felt for a humanity that had come to be such as it was at the time of the mystery of Golgotha. This was also the time of humanity's highest intellectual development, as I said yesterday. The pain and suffering gave birth to the Spirit that was poured out on the Apostles at Pentecost. Out of this pain was born the all-prevailing cosmic love, which at the baptism in the Jordan came down from the spheres of heaven that lie beyond this earth and entered the earth's sphere, a love that took on the likeness of a human being, a human body, and went through infinite suffering, beyond anything human beings can think of. Going through that moment of absolute divine powerlessness, so that the Christ impulse might be born, which we know has influenced the further evolution of humanity. These are the things we must consider if we wish to understand the deep meaning and full significance of the Christ impulse as it must be understood in times to come. Humanity will need this impulse if it is to progress along the path of civilization and development.